Hello, everyone, and welcome to Parenting in the Age of Coronavirus. This event is part of the Adaptation, Resiliency, and Care series hosted by Arizona State University's Institute for Humanities Research. We have an amazing panel joining us today, and I hope that um, everyone who's viewing has something that they can take away from this to help them have support as parents and guardians during this time. Um, I want to start with just a few housekeeping items before we turn the time over to our panel. Um, uh, in, if you're watching via Zoom, please note that the chat is disabled. If you want to enter your questions, you're welcome to do that through the Q&A. And if you're watching through YouTube, you can enter your questions as well via the comments or chat. And you can enter your questions anytime throughout the event and we'll answer those after our panelists have presented. Um, I just want to take a minute to thank our team behind the scenes on this event. We have Liz Grumbach and Selena Osuna from the IHR, as well as Joe Carter from Livestream Success, who's helping us live stream this event today. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce our first panelist, Victoria Thompson. Victoria E. Thompson's research has focused primarily on Paris, France in the 18th and 19th centuries. She's the author of The Virtuous Marketplace, Women and Men, Money and Politics in Paris, 1830 to 1870, and with Rachel G. Fuchs, Women in European History. She's the editor and a contributor to the cultural history of work in the Age of Empire. Thompson has published articles and book chapters on colonial Algeria, British travelers in revolutionary Paris, Parisian travel guides, urban monuments and revolutionary spaces and memory, and is currently completing a monograph entitled Inventing Public Space, Sentiment and Citizenship in Paris, 1748 to 1789. Thompson served as president of the Society for French Historical Studies, co-president of the Western Society for 18th Century Studies, and as co-chair of the Advanced Placement European History Curriculum Development and Assessment Committee for the College Board. She has served on prize committees for the American Historical so Association and the Society for French Historical Studies, on the editorial board of French Historical Studies, and on selection committees for the Fulbright Fellowship and the International Dissertation Research Fellowship. She, she recently served as co-director of the Institute for Humanities Research at Arizona State University. So now I'll turn the time over to you, Victoria. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you to the IHR for organizing this panel. I'm definitely looking forward to so, yeah, participate on this panel, especially since I feel underqualified. Um, I became only very recently a stepmother to two young ladies. Um, my husband assures me that it doesn't matter that you always feel like you don't know what you're doing. So um, I take him at his word. Um, my youngest daughter, Ava, lives with us. Um, her mom lives in Texas. She's just started as a freshman at Scottsdale Community College. And my oldest stepdaughter, Lucy, um, lives in Atlanta, where she's a senior at Georgia Tech. Um, over when the coronavirus pandemic and stay at home began, Ava was in Texas with her mom and Lucy was in Atlanta and there's been some kind of moving back and forth, but we've only kind of recently settled in to our current situation, which is Ava is here with us taking classes online and Lucy's back at school um, in Atlanta. So from the very beginning with all the different moving around, it's been a good lesson that I think applies to both coronavirus and parenting, which is my inability to control most things that happen. Um, so Lauren sent us some questions to think about um, in our comments. And one of the questions was, how how has our research changed? And in terms of um, how we've adapted to balance the new realities, I think that um, what I realized in a way I hadn't before, although now seems completely obvious, is that it's the scholar scholarly work, the research and writing that requires the most focus concentration. So I've had to be really strict about carving out times when I know I won't be interrupted um, to work on that. So sometimes that's early in the morning, although 
um, you know, the benefits of having a teenager in the house is it doesn't have to be too early <laughs> because she sleeps in a lot later. Um, and sometimes that's when she's in class. And so I've, you know, gotten used to that being something that really has to be scheduled and that is probably, I'm not going to spend as much time on as I would have before just because I don't have um, kind of the, what I realized was I didn't have the ability to follow a train of thought because of the interruptions. And so really making sure that, um, okay, so there's some feedback. So really making sure that that was, um, I wasn't having that. And one of the challenges that we face is that Ava, my, my youngest daughter is on the autism spectrum and also suffers from a great deal of anxiety. So that is um, behind the, you know, what interruptions is kind of a, a negative term, but that she needs a lot of reassurance and a lot of the way in which she processes things is through kind of running them by me and talking through things with me. And so my biggest challenge, I guess, would be to figure out how to be there for her and allow her to do that um, so that she can manage her own anxiety and yet also get my my work done. Um, so we come up with some strategies. I bought a sign for my door at home on Etsy that allows me to say like, come on in or I'm teaching, don't interrupt me. We have a very kind of set schedule that we follow where we, um, you know, she knows when I'm going to be available for lunch or for dinner. Um, so I think the routine really helps both of us manage our times. Um, so another thing that um, another thing that uh, Lauren asked was, you know, can we share a personal story? And um, so uh, the most one of the most recent things that happened was that we were um, having a discussion. Ava came to me and was upset about the fact that some of her friends are getting together and going out to lunch and doing things like that. And um, we aren't allowing that in our house right now. And we had a very frank discussion about that and kind of trying to, um, you know, for, for me trying to explain it to her why um, that was so that we felt it was too risky to go eat inside a restaurant right now. And for her explaining why she felt, um, that it wasn't fair, um, because her friends were getting to do that. And I think it, it's not really a funny story. I mean, Lauren mentioned, is there something we could laugh about, but it's a story that made me feel good because I felt like, we came up with a compromise that I don't think either of us are a hundred percent happy with, which is basically that she can go with her friends, but she can't eat. She has to keep it. Um, and uh, so it's not exactly what she wanted. It's not exactly what I would prefer, but I felt like we, it, gave us this opportunity to have this really open conversation where we both felt heard and understood. Um, and so I guess, you know, that was really valuable. Um, and then the final thing I'll just say real quick is that, you know, I think Ava and I and her dad, we were all looking forward to this year as one where she you know, a freshman in college, she became a little bit more independent, had some opportunities to do some things more independently. And that's not happening because of the coronavirus. So figuring out how to create that space of independence for her, I think is, is really uh, important and also uh, difficult. So I feel that those remarks were a little bit meandering, but let me, let me stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Victoria. I love that you touched on like the issues that come up with like friendship dynamics for kids right now. Um, I myself have just a little seven month old, so he's not quite there yet. You know, the stories I think of is like catching him drawing on the couch while I'm in a Zoom meeting. Um, and so as kids get, get older and they struggle with the, those social components, um, I think that's a really important thing to talk about. And I also like that you said that this is an opportunity for teaching moments. 
kind of just explaining that, you know, this isn't a perfect situation for anyone and helping kids understand that, you know, this is kind of a time for compromise and understanding. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Nalu Vega Ross as our next panelist. Nalu Vega Ross is a Ugandan American living in the dry, dry desert of Arizona. A doctoral candidate, Nala Vega's work is concerned with how people from Africa living in the United States look for information about sex and reproduction. And once they find that information, how do they use it to make decisions about having or not having sex and whether or not to reproduce? When not reading books for graduate work and avoiding writing, Nala Vega spends time watching and commenting on cartoons with her toddler and ranting to her partner about sex and reproduction in the United States. So now I'll turn the time over to her. All right, thank you so much, Lauren, and thank you for the IHR to, uh, for this opportunity. Um, I always like to start by saying, even though we're meeting virtually, we're still situated on land that was uh, the historic home for the Huhugam, the Piposh people, I'm in Tempe, and I would like to recognize them as the original caretakers and knowledge keepers of this land. Um, so when I got the call from IHR to be part of this panel, the first thing I thought of is I really want to start with giving a little bit of context. Um, what I really like to call the privilege I entered COVID-19 with. And that means for me, I my partner, uh, since we moved to Arizona, has been working from home remotely. So he was prepared for that. Um, I have one child who's a toddler um, and has absolutely no physical or uh, any other disabilities that we know of right now. And I also did my undergraduate studies in Utah among the Mormons. So food storage of some kind is something that happens in my life on a daily basis. So entering into COVID-19, those were the, the buffers that I had. Um, also, I'd spent a lot of time having Zoom meetings because the semester before, my advisor was out of the country. And so we would meet on a regular basis over Zoom. So I'd already had that experience of meeting with other people over Zoom. So kind of those things buffered me through um, when entering the pandemic. Um, so one of the things that how my research changed, even though I had that privilege and I had those buffers, I still had to be a mother, I still had to be a partner, and I still had to show up and somehow figure out how to do my work, make sure my partner had time to do his work, and make sure our daughter as well was going through, it was getting some form of education. Um, and so what happened, it really forced me to be really clear to myself what needed to get done. Uh, when we started, I had one class and I was very privileged because the professor was very kind and was able to give us a, a lot of room to navigate what was going on in our lives. So I was able to go through that class. Thank you, Dr. Vega. Um, and I was also very, I had to figure out what things needed to get done in the next three months um, and what things could, you know, could I push off later on? And so the first thing that we learned, the first thing that really helped us is we really had to schedule our lives. And I don't like schedules of any kind. Um, and so neither does the four-year-old, um, I think you're five-year-old, she's now five. And so that was the first thing that we had to do is figure out what kind of schedule we had for each one of us. And the thing that we learned really quickly is that it was very helpful for our toddler to know what she was doing when and who she was doing what with. So that was very helpful for her. And also it was very calming for us as parents to know that yes, I do have to play Barbies for the next 15 minutes, but later on I can go write that paper that's been sitting on my desk for more than a couple of months. So that was one of the things that we really, um, that really helped us. Now in that scheduling, we also had to really think about what kind of education were we doing uh, for our, for our, which was then four. Um, because when schools shut down the, the first time around, the schools had no idea what to do, especially for children that young. So we, uh, specifically me, I was on Instagram and YouTube and finding things that I could do. So we ended up doing a lot of my, one of my favorite artists is Vashti Harrison. She wrote the Little Leaders book series. She did an Instagram series where she taught people how to draw. So that's what we did. Um, again, where uh, those people who could afford to buy stuff. So we 
had a lot of cardboard in the house so we started painting on cardboard and we now have a roving cardboard gallery in our house um, it's not that fancy it's just really how much how many colors can we mix um, and also one of the things that we bought was there's what they call a, constru a cardboard construction kit so until a couple of months ago we you couldn't walk into my uh, toddler's room because we had constructed giant things because we had these little screws plastic screws that you could join different pieces of cardboard with together um, and so that kind of helped her with her education and in my part um, i again because i had such a limited time i had to use that time very very strategically and i'd figured out okay these are the things that i need to do how can i keep doing them so a couple of things that helped me as a graduate student was i had wendy belcher's how to write a journal article in 12 weeks so this was helping me plan all my articles i bought a physical calendar because i needed something that i could see um, and sometimes that just being on the computer was just a little bit too much and there were days where i'm like i just don't want to be on the computer so i actually started a dissertation journal where i wrote my thoughts for days that i couldn't I didn't want to sit in front of a computer and work. Um, and also my calendar and uh, um, helped me kind of plan out things that I could plan out because I couldn't control everything. But the few things I could control that really helped me be able to get my work done. Um, and then uh, some, of the, uh, some of the other things that really, uh, really helped me is um, it's speaking of writing because as as you had in my bio i struggle with writing i'm not very comfortable with writing so one of the things some days just getting on your computer and having this giant word document staring at you and you're supposed to write something just was not possible so one of the things that i did i i finally gave in and uh, bought scrivener the tool so i could just write little pieces at a time as i could manage um, the other thing that i would say that would really help is if you had a good internet connection um, because a lot of the things that we were using for education which was also really good because then um for the first time my daughter now could see alvin at ailey's dancers and we could do all these things because everyone was in the same boat now it's not the same anymore now that we are back in school we're still doing at home schooling and we're still stuck in that schedule because um, I really appreciate kindergarten teachers because apparently there's a lot of cutting and a lot of like supervising that's involved with trying to get a five-year-old through school from 8 a.m. all the way to 4 a.m. So we're still on those schedules where one person works at one time and the other person's with the toddler, um, and then the, the and then we switch off with which is great because um, I love the to uh, the kindergarten schedule because they have snack time so I can get a snack in so that is really really awesome for me. Um, so the funny story that I had is when we were when we didn't have an idea at the beginning of the coronavirus um, how school was going to go we kind of made up um, things that we could do that we both knew uh, both my partner and I had some education on I know I study sex no I did not teach the fourth five-year-old about sex yet um, but uh, one of the thing, the funny thing that happened is we decided we would do science because that seems like fun and we could like do experiments and that was really something that we could both kind of use our um, creativity for lack of a better word to kind of do things with the toddler um, and one day she mentioned that we were talking about pandas and she mentioned you know red pandas are not related to um, to the regular pandas and so you know my partner who works in a biology lab so gets very excited and is like oh let me teach you about phylogeny trees and I'm sitting there going this is how little black girls enter the prison the pipeline because they will sit with their teacher in first grade and go like that's not how the phylogeny tree works this is how the phylogeny tree looks like because when i was four my father explained it to me in great detail and it was this funny moment where it's like this is what happens when you have two overly educated parents is we're teaching you what we know but sometimes what we know is a little bit over <laughs> what you really need to know so um, I guess my five-year-old now is very good at phylogeny trees, and um, hopefully that does not, uh, in you know, make her a scientist. Because I'm really hoping she becomes an artist. Because we need artists. So um, I will stop there, and um, thank you.
Thank you so much, Nala Vega. Um, you both have brought up now the importance of scheduling. And I think part of that is like setting boundaries for yourself of like, this is when I'm working, this is when I'm dedicated to my family. And um, so I appreciate you both discussing kind of trying to balance that in a world where it seems impossible to balance because they're both on top of each other right now, the parenting and the work. So thank you, Nala Vega. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Lee Bibo and Suhei Vega. Uh, earning his PhD from Purdue University's program in American Studies, Lee Bibo is a professor of English at ASU, where he is affiliate faculty with the School of Transborder Studies and the program in American Studies. Bibo teaches on and researches in the areas of race, social, ju social justice, and political culture. His articles have appeared in multi-ethnic literature of the United States, Latino studies, and other scholarly journals. His book, Mytho-Historical Interventions, The Chicano Movement and Its Legacies, examines how narratives of myth and history were deployed to articulate political identity in the Chicano movement and post-movement era. His second book, Whiteness on the Border, Mapping the U.S. Racial Im Im Imagination in Brown and White, examines how representations of Mexico, Mexicans, and Mexican-Americans have been used to foster whiteness and Americanness, or more accurately, whiteness as Americanness. He has recently co-edited Teaching with Tension, Race, Resistance, and Reality in the Classroom, a volume on the challenges of and strategies for teaching about race. Suhei Vega is an Associate Professor of Women and Gender Studies and Affiliate Faculty Member in the School of Transborder Studies and Religious Studies at Arizona State University. Her research explores the everyday lived experiences of Latinas and Latinos in the U.S. By looking for moments of belonging, she traces the way Latinos make their own notion of home in the U.S. Using ethnography, oral history, and archival analysis, Professor Vega's research includes race and ethnic studies, social networks, gendered experiences, and ethno-religious practices. Her previous work focused on non-traditional Latino setting locations in Indiana to expand the notion of the borderlands to these otherwise new or not previously recorded Latino communities. Her book, Latino Heartland of Borders and Belonging in the Midwest, places, places, a dialogue, Mex, places in dialogue Mexican and non-Mexican Hoosiers of Indiana as they both come to terms with living in the same communal space. Vega's current project historically locates the growth of Latina and Latino members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the Phoenix area and the role the church plays in the lives of current Latino members. She's particularly interested in gendered social networks, primarily the Relief Society, as it engages Spanish-speaking women in church leadership and the push-pull factors that have attracted Spanish-speaking members to the church in record numbers. And now I'll turn the time over to Lee and Suhei. Hello. Um, well, let me start by saying that I'm probably going to come off as relatively composed. And, but when Lauren first sent this email months ago, my immediate reaction was, wow, that's so important that IHR is doing this. Oh, my gosh, are we going to have time to do this? Mm -hmm. um, because I was swamped. Um, and I think a lot of us were, and things have gotten a little bit better. But Lauren, thank you for putting this together, because I think this is really an important panel. I hope it is. I hope it's impactful for folks. Um, but also, I, I don't think that, that many of us could have done this three or four months ago, because mm -hmm. it was chaos uh, for a lot of us. Uh, before I talk about how we adjusted to COVID, I should probably give a little bit of background information. We have, oh, sorry. We have an 11 year old son and we adopted him when he was- Two, only 22 two, months. 22 months, almost two. And we didn't know he was gonna come into our home until maybe a couple days before he did. And so it was parenting from zero to 60, in just a few seconds. And that impacted us tremendously because while we're both professors, back then before we had children, we just work whenever we wanted to work and blah, 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 blah. But right away, as soon as we started parenting, we started alternating days that we could work because Suhei taught on Monday and Wednesday and I taught on Tuesday and Thursday. This is at a previous university. Um, and we had to switch things up. When we came to ASU and our son entered school, 
we still alternated our work schedule as much as possible. Um, we would do this primarily on the weekends. Suhei would take a morning, I would take the afternoon. The next mor on Sunday morning, I might take the morning and she would take the afternoon. And during the weekday, we'd alternate, like I would take him to school, you'd pick him up. Uh, things yeah. along those lines. We're kind of alternating this thing right here, right now. Um, so when COVID hit, we had the relationship and the structure in order to turn it into a, a relatively smooth, yet still triage situation. Um, you know, right away, ASU went online and we're like, okay, we can handle this. We, you know, we will make some adjustments. Boom. Then the schools went online and that changed things for us. Um, and so we organized things basically the way we had been before over the weekends. I take a couple hours in the morning, Sue takes a couple hours in the later morning, and then we switch in the afternoon. And let's be honest, I wasn't always as productive in the afternoon. That's just not how I am. That's when my nap schedule kicks in. Um, but the, the hardest thing, I think, after adjusting to what we needed to do for our son, for me, the hardest thing was recognizing that we weren't going to be as productive. Well, I wasn't going to be as productive as I would have been before. I just finished a draft of a chapter. I was hoping to revise it, hoping to do some other stuff. That went out the window. And I think to some extent our priorities shifted, right? So that, yes, public publishing and, and working is important, obviously. Um, it's part of our jobs. <laughs> but I think our priorities shifted to dealing with, with the triage that you're talking about in terms of having Michael home 24 hours um, having to be in charge of a schooling while also doing our own classes because at the time we were both teaching two classes um, and then just trying to figure out what was going on in the world, right? Because we both have elderly parents, oh, not elderly, <laughs> I'm <gonna tell> my <laughs> mom. Um, uh, parents who are, uh, who are, you know, at risk. And so, and, and my, my family's in Texas. And so certainly it was, it was a lot of triage. It just, it felt like it was constantly surviving every day. And I'm sure everyone in, in this phone call can attest to that. Um, with Michael, what we ended up doing for schooling is we traded off based on our strengths. I do not do well in math. Old math, new math, I don't do well. So I love it. So Lee took lot. over teaching math and actually bought a, a math book from Staples because his school, he's in a special ed program because he's ADHD. So there wasn't a lot of structure for him, even when, we went, when he went home. And so we took over that structure. So Lee got a book from Staples on math for fifth grade. Yeah, I bought it for fifth grade uh, benchmarks. And we watched YouTube videos uh, to teach him some of the math. I busted out his, my son's little whiteboard and did little math lessons while Suhei would actually say, this is how you take notes on math. Yeah, yeah. So we had to teach him basically how to learn. Um, so that was important. Uh, he also struggles with social skills. So I, I worked with them on social skills because that's, I feel like my strength and, um, it's not mine. <laughs> and, uh, and equally like I was like now the Vega was mentioning, like we went to YouTube. Um, I found this great counselor from somewhere on the East coast, Mrs. Weller, or her name is Marie Weller. She does these social studies, social skills, um, workshops for like three minutes for kids. It's fantastic. And it really is like, K kindergarten to fifth grade because my son loved them but it, they also are, are really reaching for young, younger kids too so we did that and we we started a bullet journal for him so he had like every day he'd have to write what he did that day or what he needs to do next and that kept him on task um we learned to wear headphones when we were listening to the news because we're both news junkies but we couldn't listen to the news and and have him constantly aware of everything that was going on yeah. both for COVID, but then um, as Black Lives Matter uh, started ramping up, like how do we understand this moment? And while we talked to him about it, obviously as, as a young child of color, right? We also didn't want him to be bombarded by it all the time. And he even asked sometimes, can we not listen to the news? Yeah. So we did that. Um, wh what are our concerns for this year? My, my concern is it's a lost year. And it might well be, and other, it might be a lost year for all kids. And all honesty, I think it's a bit more likely to be a lost half a year. And a lot of the kids are gonna be a half a year behind. I can live with that. As long I, as we're alive. As long as, as long as we're alive, as long as we still have jobs, ASU, <laughs> um, as long as he's healthy, and as long as he's making progress in areas that he needs to. 
and I'm not talking about math. I'm talking about the social emotional things that are so important for all kids. Um, we used to do some outings, like on the weekends, we'd go hikes or watch a movie. And I think as a family, we've had to get used to not having any outings. And that's been difficult, I think, for a lot of folks. Um, or like they would go out of the house once a day, go to the office or walk around, you know. And especially with this Arizona heat, we can't get out of the house now. So it's been difficult in terms of like, how do we all coexist literally on top of each other, right not on top of each other, but like with each other all the time instead of having these breaks from each other. I, I will add one other thing that kind of threw a wrench in the in the system is uh, about I don't know a few weeks into it we decided eh, you know let's 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 get rid of Lee's office upstairs let's get rid of my office upstairs and let's combine our offices so we're two academics with hundreds of books and now trying to share an office and trying to share space and that's also an, has been an interesting experience yeah. Yeah, because we're both teaching from home this semester. Yeah. Um, we'll just end with some quick COVID hacks. And so we don't have funny stories, but we have COVID hacks. Um, so like now Vega mentioned, I made everything a lesson. So making ice cream uh, became a science lesson. I looked up the science behind making an ice cream. We watched a YouTube behind it. I had him take notes and then write a story afterwards of what happened. He had to do a scavenger hunt for the periodic table. Um, and it's not like I assumed that he's going to learn the periodic table from COVID, but at least he's going to be familiar with, with those words and those elements, right? Yeah. We want his mind to still work, even though um, it's a lot of stress going on in the world. Um, we found Zoom play dates worked, but not with all kids. And so there's one kid from his class that he does like play dates with. They play gaming together. Um, and it's supervised. We know who the kid is and the kid's parents. So that works really well. But other kids that he hasn't seen in a long time, they just kind of stared blankly into the screen. So that was difficult. <laughs> His birthday was during COVID in May. So we had, um, we did what we could and we did a Zoom call with the whole family across different states. And that was really fun because it was the first time that ever happened. So he blew out his candles with cousins and aunts and, uh, and grandmas from across the country. But he still wants a party. Yeah. And today is one of his gotcha days, and he's still not having an opportunity to go out for dinner tonight. Although, we're going to get a special dinner home. Yeah. So, and then I guess the last hack is like balancing high dopamine with low dopamine, and that's because he has ADHD. We know those phrases. In other words, he can have some electronics, but for every one electronic, he has to do two low dopamine activities. Legos, drawing, cars, something that does not include electronics um and he knows that it's basically a two to one ratio right is that right yeah it's ratio. two to one and he and he actually says i need some ld time and he even knows now that he needs a low dopamine time okay. so that's it thank you so much i'm so glad that y'all have shared some specific resources that people can use and um ideas to balance um specifically that two to one ratio i think is is an awesome example um and I liked what you said as well about like being okay with like, maybe this half year is lost, maybe it's a challenge, but it's okay. And I think that it's like doing what we can with what we have, right? We've got um, a lot of great questions that have come in. Um, so I want to start off with this top one, which is, do you have any tips for working parents with toddlers at home? Am I the only one with a toddler? In that? <laughs> um, I think, as Lauren said, uh, boundaries uh, being and them knowing your boundaries and you giving them the opportunity to have boundaries. Um, another funny story, I told my daughter I couldn't play with her because I had a Zoom meeting. Um, and I think she got angry at me. And later on, when I said, okay, I have time to play with you. She's like, well, I don't have time to play with you. I have three Zoom meetings. And I had to be respectful of that. Even though I was like, are you, are you serious? She's like, yeah, I have three Zoom meetings. And she walked into her room. I was like, okay, I, I'm not. But I think the biggest thing is having boundaries and reinforcing them. So when you're working, saying, you know, I know you want to play but right now I'm working and I will, I'm giving them something they can look forward to. So I will, let's do it this 
after I'm done with this thing. Um, and so that I found has been really, really helpful. And then honoring that time, I am not at all a playful person. And I have learned, I've had to learn that when I say, because before it was so much easier where I could just say, okay, yes, I will come play with you. And that means I'm just going to take you outside and run you till you get tired. And that's that I can do that. But now it's like, okay, we have to go build this whole entire imaginary world and I have to contribute and somehow help you like have fun in this very in this way that I'm not very used to. And so being able to, like, you know, when you say, okay, this is when we're gonna play, then let's play at that time. And then that I think has been the biggest um for me has been the biggest thing is just making sure that that boundary is known so she knows i work from eight to ten and she cannot interrupt me when i'm working eight to ten unless it's an emergency like if she falls down and has like this blood everywhere that i'm sorry like works work stops and we have to take care of that um but she knows that that is not the time so that is one of the the things that has been really really helpful and then like suhei mentioned is what are your strengths um so yes i cannot uh play but i can totally sit there for two hours with you and splash color and things and so kind of steering them to things that are both relaxing for me because i find that relaxing but it's also playful enough for them so i can leave my work and i was like okay that was really hard so i bet and now i get to go play and paint with my toddler um, and that is kind of helping me relax and calm you know just work through whatever it was that um i was going that was hard for the work day um i know if that was very helpful um and also that one of the things that we just had to be i had to be okay with is that there would be a slight increase in screen time that some days the best i could do was i'm like you know what we're just gonna sit on this couch and watch tv and that's the best I can do right now and that's and she's like yeah I'm fine with that um and so being okay with those those that there'll be times where you really that's that's the best you can do but I think the biggest thing is definitely having boundaries between you and your toddler and saying I understand you want to play right now but I cannot but later on I can and I think that has been helpful for our five-year-old I don't know if it would work with others so can I just add how I love that now that we got references but I feel this way too that I feel like our son and having to work around this whole situation has given me time to self-care, mm -hmm. right? It's forced me to have that time to take a break and play dolls <laughs> or Legos or whatever, right? And and actually we all need that. So it's almost like the kids are taking care of us too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Thank you so much. Um, this next question um, is kind of more geared towards everyone. Um, how can we in our professional and personal communities support the parents and caregivers in our lives? So you could talk about how you found support from others or how you've offered that support. And we can start with Victoria and just um, go around. That's a great question. Um, it's hard, to, <laughs> it seems hard to answer right now. I'm not sure why. Um, so I think, one thing that has been really helpful to me um, in talking to friends or family members is just a recognition of how, um, how much strain it's putting on everyone. Um, you know, one thing I was thinking when um, everyone else was talking was that my situation at home is a little bit different because my husband works in an essential industry he's in the car business so not only you know has he worked outside of the home this entire time but he works very long hours it makes it hard for me being the one who's home all the time um you know managing everything but it also makes it hard for him because you know he has to be into a work environment that's very stressful and also very scary dealing with the public and then when he comes home we want his attention you know like that's our excitement for the day as someone new coming into the house and so um you know we've been in conversations with my mom i've had a lot of conversations about just the the strain that it puts on everyone and just recognizing that 
we're all doing the best we can, I think is really helpful. Um, I guess, you know, in terms of me helping other parents, that's mostly happened with my students. So the students in my classes who have children who communicated with me about various situations going on at home, um, that means, you know, they're going to miss class or they're going to work is going to be late or whatever. And, and my approach has been basically to say, we're all doing the best we can do the work when you can. Um, you know, I think just like giving everyone a break is, um, in a way the, has been the most helpful to me. I think um, this is a question as a, a parenting graduate student that I ask um, myself all the time, and I would hope that this is something that we carry forward past COVID. Scheduling things past 6 a.m., 6 p.m. That to me, that is prime, that's dinner time, that's play time, even if they were in school, that's time we're all kind of relaxing from the day. And then, you know, you have these meetings that are like 6 p.m. Uh, for, for toddlers and, or um, in the middle, like 2.50 when they leave school at 2 p.m. Like those are all like things that is, it's really thinking when you're scheduling things about parents and how and what they need for, um, to be able to take care of their families. So that's the first thing that always, um, and it, I think I, I think it's on my mind as well because now that we've moved to a lot of things being online, there's a lot of stuff happening because people can use Zoom. And so there's always this, I get this feeling of the, the fear of missing out because I'm like, oh, that great thing's happening. It's on Zoom, I could totally make it. Also it's at 6 p.m. I cannot do that because that is prime family time. So that's something that I always, um, think about is that when you're scheduling things, please uh, consider what parents are um, thinking or are, are having to do and what how they're having to juggle. Um, I think that's the biggest one that, that was on my mind is like, when, when do we schedule things and are we paying attention to the parents or people or caretakers who have to go um, home, pick up children, um, you know, daycare ends at a specific time when we had daycare or, you know, all those things come into play um, to really think about that even after COVID ends is like really when you're scheduling things, can you think about the parents and what that time frame that you give them is, how is it affecting their home life? Um, and as a graduate student, I think for me, the other thing that I always think about is um, what people expect from me. Uh, I can't do certain things, just I can't produce as much simply because I've made the decision. Um, I jokingly used to tell people, I'm like, I am so ready to fail out of grad school because I don't work weekends. And after 6 p.m., that's family time. Um, and there's this glorification in, um, I feel, in academia that you must work these long hours and you brag about how much sleep you did not get. And that's like, I needed hours of sleep and I just don't work weekends. So being really thinking really critically when we're assigning work or giving work or even asking people to do things like how much labor are we putting on them and how does that affect people who are parenting? Because I don't have, I, you know, weekends, I can't work. We, I've just made this choice. I don't work weekends. So that's something that I really like really think about what you're asking when you're asking parents and anyone in general, like when you're asking someone to do something like what, how are you going to compensate their labor and how are you thinking about the time commitment you're asking them? So really thinking critically about it. So those are the two things that kind of come to my mind. I'm not sure I have anything to add other than just signal boosting something Nella Vega said, which is this pandemic offers us a significant opportunity to really learn. In the first month or two of the pandemic, or at least when the shuts, shutdowns were happening, there was this tremendous sense of mutuality. People cared about each other, you know. I don't want to get you sick. You don't want to get me sick. Um, I don't. I know. I know things are hard for you, and I hope you understand that things are hard for me. And that that sense of mutuality seems to be dissipating right now. And obviously, 
universities are going to learn things like, oh, wow, we got a new teaching modality, new ways of teaching. Yes. We could also learn about the common humanity and what we need to do to care for each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Nalubega was getting at. I just think it's exceptionally important. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I um, I love what Nala Vegas said about, um, you know, we, we can't do as much now, and that's okay. Um, one thing that crossed my mind is my husband and I used to be a lot more involved volunteering for our church community, and we've had to say to them, you know what, like, we're still involved, but we're not going to be as involved, and this is why. And I think being comfortable and okay with speaking up for yourself and saying that is really important because... Um, at least for me, like family is number one priority, right? Uh, we have so many good questions and I hope we can get to them all, but um, I, we did have a couple questions come in about um, teens, so I wanna address that. Um, so, uh, let's see here. We have a couple people looking for advice, looking for advice for parents with teens. They are way too old to want to play with parents but too young to have the independence they desperately want. How can I give my teenager the freedom and fun they want while still keeping them and my family safe? And I know we talked about that a little bit, but if we could touch on it more, that would be great. Yeah, that's such a hard question. Um, I read a, an article when I first uh, started my step parenting journey, which was really helpful to me. That was like, your teenager wants you to be a potted plant. And what it basically was saying was that they want you around, but kind of in the background. So one of the things that I've committed to, and this again gets to the point about just have to accept we're not going to be working as much as we might have in the past, is that in you know when when we stop work at the end of the day, you know around four thirty or five, that's pretty much it. And um, I will, you know, feed make dinner and then go sit on the couch um, with Ava and we'll watch tea and you know we're not necessarily she might take some breaks and be on her phone or call her friends or whatever but I'm just there um, you know and I think that's made a big difference also um, she and her friends do called house party and it's like a social networking site that we're in play games and i think this is like really important like you were talking about you know are they just going to stare at each other over zoom you know but it gives them some activities i think they were playing uno the other day where they can kind of hang out in a um in a little bit of structure um and so she you know she really likes that um and that's been fun for her um you know the problem again with arizona is the heat it's so difficult like we've talked about you know that her um you know the idea of like going and sitting in a park and you know everyone bringing a food to have that is socially distanced but we don't want to do that because it's too hot you know or um we don't have a yard we have a townhouse and a complex there's a pool and I said you know they could come over a couple friends and sit socially distanced around the pool but again it's like it's too hot no one wants to do that so um that I agree that's a real challenge like how do you think of fun things for a while in the summer when Lucy and Ava were here what I was doing is I have a whiteboard on the refrigerator and I would um, go through the week and at least three days a week we would think of a fun activity that we could all look forward to so like sometimes it was go to Dutch Brothers sometimes it was pizza and movie night um, so that and it, and I liked it too it like it kind of marked the passage of time which was really important during the summer and um, it set up this sense that like we were still going to try to do fun things um, we've done a couple of zoom parties my husband husband and I organized it with our friends that the kids have also sat in on. Um, they know the people we're, you know, we're Zooming with and, um, or family, you know, Zoom things that without a, people out of town. So I think just like being, for me, being conscious of trying to plan things to look forward to um, has a difference.
this may not answer the question specifically for te for teens, um, but maybe taking it a little bit more towards a tween age. Um, one thing that we did, we, we love movies in our family. <laughs> um, and Suhei, I think within the first week or two of COVID made a list of like 30 or 40 movies that we were gonna watch. And of course, I think one of them was like the Avengers or something like that. So we watched all 22 Marvel Cinematic Universe films, um, not quite in chronological order, we should have, and next time we will, um, but we've done a lot of different movies. And so we do a, like a movie a night or half a movie a night because our kid goes to bed earlier. Um, the other thing we've been doing, and, to, and this was feasible until it got to about 115, was mm, we, bike rides. we did bike rides, mm. but we, I also took our bat. We have like a portable basketball hoop yeah. and I put it on the sidewalk. I'm sure my neighbors hate it, whatever. Um, and it's facing the street. And so Michael and I could not in the middle of the afternoon, cause you're right. It's absolutely too hot, but at seven in the morning, we can shoot basketball for 30 minutes. And it's a little bit of Michael dad time play a little bit of basketball. Okay, now go do something with your brain or go do something creative and give me some time to go do something else. Or we would play against each other and our, one of our neighbors would cheer us on, cheer me on. He'd be happy for me yeah. to have a basket, so. <laughs> Nala Vega, did you want to add anything? Okay, Sean's a check. Um, so we're getting close to time. So I think what I'd like to do is, um, address this last question and if you want to add any final thoughts or advice um, along with that that would be great so this question is do you have any stories about or advice for addressing and talking about anxiety and uncertainty with children right now so i guess um stories because i you know uh, it's like with everything, I don't know how well I'm doing this. So I wouldn't want to raise it to the level of advice. But um, I, um, in general, I, um, one of my goals is to be honest with the girls about everything, um, but also to tailor it to their level of understanding and to make uh, less to buffer it a little bit. So, you know, like the comments about watching how, how much news I watch in front of them. Um, it's definitely, I do that as well. Um, one of the things I realized in that conversation that I was talking about earlier with Ava is that, um, there, the way in which I approach like what we do and what we don't do um, in regards to coronavirus is very much an academics way. You know, here's the data, these, you know, I've read all these things, this is what I'm comfortable with, this is what seems to be working, this is how disease is transmitted. Um, and that is, and I do communicate that way with Ava, but it's also really important for me to kind of think more like how I am with a teacher teaching my freshmen and then translate it into, you know, something that's more accessible. So like moving from, well, you know, the reason why you can't go have lunch with your friends is, you know, think about when kids have, when you have a cold or you have the flu and how it's spread. Um, I think part of my like wanting to be there for Ava when whether it's sitting on the couch watching TV or having, you know, a lot of the day being times when she can come in to talk to me and I can interrupt what I'm doing is that she because of the way she processes information, we go over things several times and that's part of her anxiety is going over things again and again. And so just being there and being someone that she can ask questions of and talking through things with and reminding her that the science also says that, you know, most people who get it don't get seriously ill and that, you know, we're doing everything we can to be safe. Um, and like not what I try really hard is to not get frustrated about 
talking about the same things again and again. It's, you know, it's like the conversation that I might have in my mind where I'm worrying about the same thing over and over, but it's just out loud with her. So it's been, um, for me, one thing that's really important is like, it doesn't matter how many times we have to talk about something, if that's going to make her feel um, safer, then it's worth it. So. Um, I think uh, for me, um, as a, um, oh, this is a hard one. As a black mother, I take my cues for dealing with anxiety from the Black Lives Matter movement and how to talk to our children about that. Because to me, um, I know I've done everything that I can do to protect my child against um, COVID-19, but there are other things that are completely out of my control, like how she's viewed. Um, and so a lot of it is really trying to bring it down to her level I and mean, really trying to explain to her what, um, what this is and why we can't go home. And then also giving her um, a, a, f a picture of the future um, and saying, yes, so a couple of months ago, we could not, you could not go outside at all, at all. But guess what? Now you can go out on your bike as long as you wear a mask. And so we're we're over that. Like we've we've gone over that hump. And so we keep a list of like we asked her to do a list uh, when we were in lockdown and said, okay, when if this ends, what are the things you'd like to do? What are like what's your wish list? And so every once in a while we'll pull it out and say, you know, um, things are looking better. So this is one thing we can do. Or, you know, we have it within our funds to be able to do this this thing. And also reminding her of all the cool things she got, right? Uh, she got two months off school in, in COVID. So that was, the, she didn't have her teacher, um, you know, talking to her every day for like, like two whole months. Uh, she got to eat, watch movies almost nightly, which was something that didn't happen um, again. And so that was pretty cool. And it's also understanding that now she's over it. She's like, I, I want to go back. And we're we like, you know what? We, we really can't do that. But here are the things that we can do. Here's what I can give you right now and still keep you safe. Um, and so that's, I think, how, and just being honest, uh, being honest both about our fears and being honest and listening to her fears as well. Um, being honest and saying, hey, you know, I know you really, really want to go to the park and play on the swing, but if you go on the swing, you might get this thing and it's not going to be really good for you. And then if you get it, mommy gets it and then daddy gets it. And we're all going to be sick and we can do nothing but cough on each other and just lay there doing nothing. And so those are kind of the things that we like, those are the kind of conversations that around COVID that we're really having with her is just really being honest and telling her why we're doing certain things. She now, she knows she has to wear her mask every time she leaves the house and she's okay with that. And she knows why she's doing it. And also um, giving her something to look forward to, because again, it, when you're five, it seems never ending if you've been home for a week without seeing your friends. Like to her, that is like a thousand years. Um, we're also very, both her and I are very dramatic people when we're like inconvenienced. So she will like go on these huge, like I just wanna be outside and I'm like, eh, we, we can't do that. But if you wake up early, it's 5 a.m., we will go outside and we will do whatever you want because no one's there. So just giving her something to look forward to and just being really honest and saying, hey, this is what we can and can't do. So let's, let's work in that, that parameter. And I'll just quickly add that, the, I mean, similarly, it's about, you know, not avoiding, because I, I have anxiety issues too. And obviously if somebody tells me you're going to be fine, don't worry about it, that's not going to help. So, you know, confronting it to their level. Um, I know right at the beginning, I watched a video um, on how to wash your hands. You know, they're like this way, like a surgeon does. And he watched it with me and he loved it because then he, now he felt like he was in control, like there was something he could do. Um, same thing with masks. I'm a mask maker, like I made all our homemade masks. So, you know, he'd watch me make them, but then I'd also have him choose what fabric he wanted. Um, yeah. Oh, we did a COVID journal too, because, you know, I'm a historian as well. And so I said, 
you know, a hundred years from now, just like, cause there was a lot of comparisons early on to the, the, the Spanish flu. So I said, you know, just like the Spanish flu, a hundred years from now, your great, great grandchildren, right. Or, or, you know, the people that are living in this area will hear about this event. So we should do our part to, to write it down and what did we do today and, and what was today like? And even if we're frustrated or, or if we're sad or if we're happy, right. What was today like? And we kept the journal going, it's not active so. anymore, but but at least that, that helped us process um, our feelings, but also really truly take down what, what was going on around us because it really will be impactful for generations to come. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, just personally, as a new mom, I am just like blown away by the advice and the examples that you've shared and you're such incredible examples to me. Um, and I know that our viewers have gained some valuable insights as well. And I just wanna close um, by sharing that a week from today, we have our next event in this series, which is Community in the Age of Coronavirus, where, where we will hear from uh, local Phoenix leaders on how to build community during a pandemic. So if you're interested in that, you can um, register at ihr.asu.edu slash events. Um, so we'll hope to see you there. And I just wanna thank everyone who participated in planning this event and attending, and we'll see you next time. Bye.